Hi, Dave Coplin here with another Rise of the Humans hands-on workshop. This week we are going to be learning about the importance of creativity and especially in the context of coding. So being able to manipulate computers, being able to get them to do what you want them to do is actually a really powerful tool, regardless of whether you go on to be a coder or not. And I want to kind of make that link. Um, in order to do this week's workshop, you're going to need a little bit of equipment. You're going to need one of these beautiful little things. This is a BBC micro bit or just a plain old micro bit. Um, you're going to need an internet connected computer because you're going to need that to program the micro bit. You're going to need one of these guys and I'm going to tell you where you can get one of them uh, a bit later on. They're going to cost you about 15 quid, uh, but oh my God, it is so worth it. Uh, these guys, as we'll hear later, are kind of like the chocolate hobnob uh, of computing. They are, once you've started to mess around with them, you just can't, you just can't stop. Um, and you're going to need about half an hour. This is just a really uh, easy introduction to the micro bit. But more importantly, I want to show you how easy it is to get into them so that you can then start to use them to start to do amazing things in your own projects. Um, now, this all starts about a conversation or starts with a conversation about the skills that are going to be important for all of us, but especially our kids uh, in the future. And part of the challenge that we have is that we typically, when we think about education and we think about skills, we think about the tools that are available to us today. And that's the things that we think that we should teach our kids about. It's the things that we think will be important. But the problem with the tools of today is really quite often they're not the tools of tomorrow. And let me give you an example. I'll give you an example from my personal life. If I tell you that my grandparents, they went to school uh, in London and the northwest of, of England, then actually in the, my grandparents in the northwest of England, their schools didn't have electricity. Can you imagine that? No electricity at school. My mum and dad, they went to school and when they went to school, there were no computers. This is actually the first computer that I got to use at school. It was a Commodore PET. Actually, it was the beginning of my whole journey. It was lovely. Um, uh, then I went to school. I went to university in a world where there was no World Wide Web. There was an internet of sorts, but not like you have it today. And there was certainly no web browser. But the story continues, right? Because my son, he goes to school today in a world without quantum computers. But can you imagine if all we ever do is teach the kids about the tools that are available today, how do we help them prepare for the world that they will actually inherit rather than just preparing for the world that we're used to? And that's part of our challenge. And I think in the context of the rise of the humans, when it comes to being ready for the future, I think it's actually pretty straightforward. I just think there are three really, really important human skills that are going to be important for all of us, but especially our kids, if they're going to be successful in the future. The first skill is creativity. Creativity is one of the most powerful forces we have as humans. And we're going to need lots of creative people. And I mean creativity in its broadest sense. So not just traditional forms of creativity and as important as things like music and art are just absolutely great. I also want the other kind of creativity. The creativity that you see in engineers when they try and solve a problem. The creativity that you see, and you'll see it in your kids when they encounter challenges, they often do really innovative things in order to solve those problems. I can tell you right now that the organisations of the future will be facing problems that we don't understand, that we've never come across before, and they're going to need really creative minds to be able to help solve them challenges. And we're going to come back to creative. It's really a focus of today's conversation. But just for completeness, let me tell you the other two skills. The other human skill that I think is going to be really, really important to our future is empathy. For all of the power of the machines, for all of the amazing things that technology will do for us, humans will still interact with other humans. And the algorithms, as great as they are, they suck at things like empathy. I can create a, an algorithm that can detect your emotions simply by doing facial recognition and looking at the way that you frown or smile and interpreting that. But the algorithm doesn't innately know what that means. We need to make sure that humans are prepared and able to engage with other humans, to understand what it's like to be them and to be able to change the way that they interact with them as a result. Empathy is the second most important human skill. And the third and final skill is really simply accountability. And it works on a couple of levels. On one level is just because the algorithm tells you that this is the answer, it doesn't make it the answer. It's your job as a human to take responsibility for that input from the algorithm, but use your own human judgment in combination with it to come to the right answer. We have to be accountable for how we use technology if we're going to get to the magic of all that it has to offer. So look, they're the three most important human skills. I want to really drill down on creativity. And creativity 
creativity is so important to us to where we're going. But the problem with creativity is we don't always connect it in the right way to this world, to the world of computing. And actually, I think this is a big part of why we struggle. I, I, I'm sure you are aware that the technology industry has a massive issue when it comes to diversity. And I don't think we encourage the right kind of people to always uh, enjoy or explore a career in technology. And I think primarily it's because we scare them off. We present this world of computer science and coding. Don't get me wrong, coders. I know that coding is brilliant. And I know that actually the best coders in the world are probably some of the most creative people in the world. But we're increasingly in a world where the tools become simpler. And actually, as long as I've got a creative mind and a basic understanding of how technology works, I can actually build those two worlds, combine those two worlds together to make amazing things. Now, let me give you some examples. And this is where these lovely computers come into things like the Raspberry Pi and the Microbit. And again, we'll come back to the specifics of this in a minute. But let me give you an example. So behind me on the screen is actually my son's homework from a few years ago. It's about four or five years ago. And he was asked to create a, a board game based on the Egyptians, right? Fantastic project. And so you can see he created a lovely little board game. But when he got to making the dice, he just thought, well, do you know what? I could just get a dice out of another board game I've got. Or maybe, maybe I could do something a bit more imaginative. And so this is what he did. Um, he created a pyramid, bless him, um, and painted it. And on, front of the, on the front of the pyramid, he attached a, a little micro bit that he'd programmed. And I'm just going to dim the light so you can see this uh, a bit better, such that when I shake the micro bit, it generates a random number between one and six. So he created the dice for his game. Now, look, I'm not just trying to say that my son's a little genius and he did this. He's just a normal kid. He's like all of your kids, right? He just wanted to do something a bit more. He's okay with computers. So we thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could do this? And this is my point. Using technology, not as coding as the end result, but to create things that have more value, to create things that could be greater than the sum of their parts. And if we can do that, if we can help people engage with that and really understand what's possible then we can start to do some really magical things i also think when you address coding in terms of what you could make with it and certainly what you could make in the physical world that's the point at which we can encourage a broader spectrum of people into the industry one of my proudest moments was actually working with a school and a team of people on the rocket car challenge and, and jazz if you're out there thank you so much for this initiative and basically it was could we get kids to make a rocket car out of a foam block, some standard wheels. What we'll do is we'll stick one of these devices into the heart of, of the vehicle and we we'll use that at the accelerometer to measure its speed. Now, as far as the adults were concerned, the kids are learning about computer science and physics and en design and engineering, all those great things. But the kids, the kids didn't perceive that they were learning those things. To the kids, they're building a rocket car. That's the excitement for them. They are engaged with the outcome of what they do. This is the magic. This is the answer for what we have to do. So I've made my pitch. I've tried to help you understand the power. And let me introduce you to the star performer in all of this. And it is this wonderful little computer. This is an initiative from the BBC, uh, I think in 2017. Um, for those of you of a certain age, you'll remember the BBC Micro. It was kind of my era of computing when I was at school. And it was an initiative from the BBC in the UK to create an affordable computer that people could have at home so their kids could learn to code. And, you know, I actually didn't have one, but many of my mates did. And we spent a lot of time in front of those guys these were the days where if you wanted to play a game you didn't go to an app store and download it you bought a magazine and in the magazine would be about three pages of code that you would sit and type in code line by line and if you were lucky if you were really really lucky you would get your code right and th there you go you would play your game and then when your mum and dad came in because they wanted to watch the tv you would turn the computer off and if you wanted to play that game again you would have to do it all again kids today you don't know how lucky you are so um, the micro bit, let's have a look at this. So it's a tiny little device, really fantastic, has a USB port. More importantly, it's got a couple of buttons um, and a little uh, a six by six LED matrix that we can light up. Most importantly, it has a little rail at the bottom that we can use to connect to other devices. So uh, yes, we can do lots of stuff with the, the, the micro bit on its own, but we can also do lots of other amazing things when we combine it with some other bits of technology, which I'll talk about in a bit. It also has things like an accelerometer, so it knows which way up it is, it knows where it's moving. And based on this, we can do some really, really interesting things. 
So before we get a bit deeper into the demo, I just wanted to show you where you could get your microbit from. Look, there, there are lots of places uh, where you can buy microbits from, but I'm going to pick on two in particular because they're my favourites and they've been uh, good to me uh, all uh, all over the years in getting kit. I have no commission with them, no commercial relationship with them. I'm just a fan of what they do. Uh, so the first is Kitronic. Uh, Kitronic do lots of microbit stuff. The, the thing I also wanted to point out, when you're buying a microbit, just be mindful that there's a number of different kits that you can buy. You can buy the board on its own and that's okay and obviously a little bit cheaper but in order to do the projects that we're going to talk about and in really in order for you to have the most fun you really want to go for this starter kit because not only does it include the board but it also gives you a battery pack and and a, a micro usb cable the battery pack probably more than anything is most important because it means that you can use the micro bit in a, in a portable sense once you've programmed it um, and then if i pick on my other favorite organization and we're going to be talking a lot more about pimerani when it comes to the raspberry pi stuff but Pimeroni not only sell the boards, they also sell uh, just all of these different kits uh, that you can do. Uh, you can add to your micro bit to basically give it greater capability more quickly. So over the months ahead, weeks and months ahead, we will come back to those. But the best place for us to really get started with our microbit journey is here. It's a, a website called makecode.microbit.org. Um, and it is in joint development with Microsoft. And um, what the organizations are trying to do is to show kids how accessible coding can be. And they've created a series of uh, walkthroughs, tutorials, and a really straightforward coding environment for you to use to be able to program them. And, and it's kind of, let's take a look at the, the program environment because there's a good conversation here. Your kids will already be used to this kind of environment. It's likely if your kids have done computer science at school, and when I say kids, I'm talking about probably from the age of eight to 12, um, they will have used a, a, a programming environment called Scratch, which is very sort of like this drag and drop. Um, and the important thing about this actually is there's a, I was gonna say it's a new development, it's not a new development at all, but there's a growing trend in, in the software world of this thing called low code. And what low code is, is giving business professionals access to tools like this to enable them to build their own bits of software, their own phone apps, whatever, it may be to help them to solve business problems. Now I know that the coders in the audience will be thinking well that's not coding and I get that right and coding is a magical force and you guys are amazing but what these platforms do is they make the power of software accessible to the non-computer science people to people who have a goal in mind things that they want to do for their business and so actually as our kids learn to code and they learn computational thinking and how to manipulate technology through platforms like this it will actually add value value to them when they enter their world of work because if they feel comfortable in these environments then again they're going to have greater power over the technology to do the things that they want to do. So let's just uh, follow the tutorial and uh, you can see how straightforward this is. So I just click on there's a tutorial here called Dice. I click on that. Uh, I start the tutorial. It opens up a window and you can see uh, that uh, I'm going to get step-by-step -step instructions which is kind of brilliant uh, but also um, I'm going to be in this sort of uh, drag and drop coding environment. So Remember, kids, uh, that if we want to uh, program a computer, any kind of computer, uh, we need to give it instructions. And the first instruction we kind of need to give the computer is we need to activate it. We need to tell it when to wake up to do something. So the first line of code we're going to do in our dice demo is we're going to give it an input. Right, and the input is going to be to use the accelerometer on the micro bit. And remember, an accelerometer is a device that lives in your smartphone or your tablet, and it tells the device if the object is, is moving. So we're going to click on the input section here and I'm going to take that and I'm going to drag that onto my programming window and the input it says on shake so you can see it's pretty straightforward what does that mean it means that when this gets shaken I'm going to do something so I've done the first step in my tutorial I go to the next one and so now I want it to do something so once it's been woken up it's been shaken we want it to show a number so I can click on my basic and I can drag that. So all I've done is by dragging that command and placing it as part of the program, you can see it's the next step in the program. And we want it to show a number. Um, so that would be our next step. So we're gonna pick a random number. Because you don't want a dice, and remember a dice will be six-sided in, in this example. So a random number between one and six. So if I go to my math function, I can put pick random and I can drop that in there and I'm, ooh, and I'm going to put that to one and I'm going to put that to six. 
and guess what? That's it. We're done. So in the, this programming environment, there is a, a simulator, an emulator of the microbit. And actually, so we can test our code before we download it to our little device. So if I click on the shake button, you can see as I click on the shake button, it's generating a random number. So that's all well and good. Why don't we see what happens in real life? I'm gonna get my micro bit, and if I bring my camera back online. So let's uh, get my micro bit. Here's a little guy here. And all I have to do is just simply plug uh, it into a USB cable that's plugged into my computer, wait for the beep. And you can see as far as the computer's concerned, I've just added uh, a USB device. It's like I've plugged a USB key in. So if I flip back to my code, if I want to add that code to this micro bit, I simply click on the download button. And this is a process called compiling. So what's happening right now in the browser is it's taking my code and it's converting it into the specific instructions that this particular device uh, can understand. Uh, it creates a file that's put in my downloads folder. So if I go there, all I have to do if I want to program the micro bit is I simply drag and drop the file onto the micro bit and you'll see the file get copied across. Sometimes takes a few seconds. And once that copy's finished, if we go back to my desk cam, you'll see here's my micro bit. If I give it a shake, uh, we get a random number. So there you go, my micro bit dice coding is complete. So do you get a sense for how simple that is, how straightforward that is, and also how great these devices are, especially if you've got younger kids, uh, to be able to show them very quickly how you can get those kinds of results. While we're here though, let's just quickly jump to another little exercise, another tutorial that I think again, you'll, you'll find some fun with. Uh, this is something we uh, used to do a lot in the workshops that we used to run back in the day. Uh, Andrew Lee, how are you? Um, <laughs> Uh, let's go back to rock, paper, scissors. And I should also say Phil and Nathan, thanks for your help back in the day. Uh, let's do rock, paper, scissors. Uh, so you think about the, the logic of rock, paper, scissors, the game. Uh, it's about a, a variable, one of three uh, options. And it's about a rule base uh, on, on that, uh, that you base the whole game around. So that's a really complicated way of explaining a very simple old game. So again, we just simply start the tutorial uh, and the tutorial will tell us what we need to do. And I'm gonna drop out of this picture just so you can get a better view of what's going on. Um, and so here we are, we're gonna say, we're gonna use the accelerometer. So remember that's the device that tells the micro bit that it's moving to activate uh, a bit, uh, the selection of a random variable. We're getting the instructions. Remember the micro bit, like all computers, needs to be told uh, when to activate. And so we're gonna use the accelerometer again to go on shake. So let's go input on shake. And then the next bit is we're going to create a variable. Now, a variable in coding terms is essentially a classification of something that could be a number of different things. Think about it in the context of rock, paper, scissors. Uh, your variable is actually, it could be a rock, it could be paper, it could be scissors. So our new variable is going to be called hand, and we're going to create that variable right now. So let's make a variable called hand. And we're going to drag that, just as the instructions say, uh, into our code. And we're going to get that variable to be a random number and we're going to constrain the random number between one and three so we want it to be a one or two or a three uh, so again we go back to our maths and we click on pick random and we add that one two three that's our next option this is where things start to get a little bit tricky um, and because we're going to introduce uh, some, some, we're going to introduce some logic to what we do, and this is a great opportunity. Again, with sort of younger kids, uh, the educationalists would call this about sort of learning about computational thinking, which is just a really fancy way of saying we're going to help people understand how computers work. Because if you understand how computers work, then actually you can interpret their results a lot more easily. You can also learn how to manipulate them a, a lot more effectively. And our logic is simply going to say if it's this variable so if our random number is one let's make that equal uh, rock if that random number is two let's make that equal scissors if that random number is three let's make that equal paper so again we're building our game using that very simple logic so back to our code then we are going to uh, create a little bit of logic we're going to say if this uh, variable uh, is true um, 
so if our hand variable is equal to one, so remember we've got a random number uh, between one and three, uh, then we're going to show some LEDs and uh, we're going to set one to uh, paper. So what I'm doing here is you can imagine what the show LED command does. This is my six by six LED matrix on the micro bit and I'm just going to get it to show that. So that's this bit of code. Uh, so if we click on the shake simulator on the code, uh, if we do it enough times, uh, so bear in mind we're getting a random number between one and three, it will draw the paper so you can see it's created uh, the, the uh, diagram that I've drawn on the LEDs. Perfect. So let's move to the next step. So uh, in computational thinking terms, so again this gets a, you know, a little more interesting, we have this if command. So if this thing exists, then do this. But if it doesn't do that, else, I want you to do something else. So we're now going to create our else command, uh, which is simply going to be uh, repeating the same command. So if hand is equal to two, I've got to stop moving that. Let's bring that up a bit. And I've jumped ahead we're going to make a picture of scissors so two is going to be scissors so again show leds and let's draw our little scissors there we go so uh, let's just advance that so we're going to add our final uh, else uh, command uh, so remember there's three variables oh wrong spot we're going to put that there um, and we're going to get our logic yeah, so we've got three variables, so clearly we want to make sure that we've got all bases covered. And obviously this time it's three. And we are going to create our rock. And confusingly, the tutorial has flipped those around, but let's go and draw our rock. And there's our little rock. Now, so we can test this, remember, um, if we go back to our little simulator here in the top uh, left-hand corner, and I click on the shake button, and you'll have to do it a few times to see, but you can see just randomly I'm getting either rock, paper, or scissors. Fantastic. And that is it. So all we have to do now, and let's go back to our uh, desk cam, is uh, let's download that to our micro bit. So remember, how simple it is, all I do, I plug in the device, uh, I flip back to my code, and I click on download, and it compiles the code to a file, which I can drag and drop onto my micro bit. Now remember that the micro bit can only actually operate one line of code. So this will replace our dice program and put the new rock, paper, scissors program on instead. Go back to our desk cam and let's see how we've been able to do it. Give it a shake. Uh, excellent. So scissors. So we're going to do this at one, two, three. Ha! Oh, yes, left hand wins. See, this is how much fun you can have on your own. Imagine how much fun you could, you could have if you do this with other people. So that's it. That's all I really wanted to show you today was just how simple and accessible coding can be. But again, not for the sake of just coding, for the sake of what you can build. And the thing I'd love you to take away from this is to think about, given that this is so straightforward and, and so much fun, what else could I do? What are the other projects that we could do together, uh, you know, with your kids or maybe just, just yourselves, that you could start to integrate this kind of capability into? If you were to bring a little bit of the 21st century technology into any of the things that you do, what could you do? And over the coming weeks and months, that's really my goal here is to show you how you can do that and how much fun you can have and how it doesn't have to be. You don't have to be techies. You don't have to be a geek like me in order to have that sort of fun. So thank you so much for joining me for this workshop. I hope you'll come back for more. Don't forget, there's also the weekly live stream uh, where every Wednesday, six o'clock British summertime. I uh, hope to see you there. Let me know what you thought. Let me know your feedback. And of course, if you get a chance, we would love your subscription too. Thanks for joining and we'll see you next time.